Good morning, Trinity Fellowship, and welcome to church. It is great to be every, with everybody today. Such a beautiful day. Can you believe it is the first weekend of August? Y'all didn't sound very excited about that. I love it because it means we're closer to Christmas, so my listening to Christmas music is not quite so weird as it was last month. But anyway, I, I'm so excited about this new year, so excited about the new school year that is coming. I just want to, and I know this is a little early to be talking about school, but I just want to say I really do believe God has revival coming for the schools and the youth and the students that are a part of Trinity Fellowship Church. This is an exciting year. And I'm very excited about all of our campuses and everything God's doing. This is going to be a very big year. So be praying into that. If you have kids that are going to school, I know you're praying. But even if you don't, be praying for our youth in the school. This is a very significant time. And as it is the first weekend of the month, it also means that this coming Wednesday is First Wednesday. And I want to encourage you at every campus as well as live online, we do First Wednesday. First Wednesday is usually an hour, hour and 10 minutes where we set aside every month to just spend time praying pressing in, worshiping, pressing into the prophetic, pressing into Holy Spirit, and just having a time to pour ourselves out before God. And I want to encourage you, it's important. It is a key aspect of our spiritual growth and our spiritual development that we regularly have encounters with Holy Spirit. And that's what First Wednesdays are for. So I want to encourage you, it's one hour a month, set aside that time, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, again, live at every campus as well as live online. Make yourself available. Come, be a part of that, and I promise you, it will set you up for the rest of the month. That's why we do it the first Wednesday of the month to get us going for the rest of the month. Also being the first week, this means this is our week to take up our tithes and our offerings together. And I just want to share, you know, as children of God, we should be the most generous people on the planet because we have the most generous heavenly father, right? God is generous with us. And so our response to God's generosity ought to be for us to also be generous. And so as he's generous with us, he has entrusted us with his generosity. Look at these verses. This is Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. Now think about the proverb. Be generous and more, you know, give and more is going to be given to you. That's really what the proverb is saying. As we invest and as we give, more is coming our way. Be stingy and lose everything. Verse 25. The generous will prosper those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. We are called to be a generous people. The Apostle Paul says this this way in 2 Corinthians 9, talking about taking up an offering. He says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And that's really our attitude. At Trinity, when we talk about giving and we come to giving, I really want to encourage you, you know, God doesn't need your money. And I would say this, the church doesn't need your money, though I promise to steward tithes and offerings well. We're very careful about how we steward our tithes and offerings. But it's not about the church trying to raise funds. It's about us as a people entering into the generosity that God has for us. And I really want to challenge you. I really want to challenge you. As your pastor, I want to challenge you. If Trinity Fellowship, if you consider this your church home. Now, if you're visiting with us, we're so glad you're here. Just sit back and enjoy for a minute. But if you consider this your home, is this is where you bring your family? Is this is where you're getting blessed? Is this is where the place you're looking for for your spiritual growth, your spiritual food? I want to encourage you to be generous with sowing into this ministry. You know, to attend and to be a part of something and to take from something without giving something, can we just say ain't cool? Or let me say it this way, it's immature. Right. Is we're going to grow in the Lord, we're going to grow in becoming like the Lord. So I really do, I want to challenge you to become generous. If you're not generous, if you're just in that place of taking and not giving, I want to encourage you to become generous. Trust God in this. Look at what he says. Give freely and become more wealthy, but be stingy and lose everything. When we think we're holding on to something we're going to lose everything, but when we're generous, we gain everything. And we're going to talk more about that as we go through the message today. We'll see this principle played out really in every aspect of our lives. But when it comes to our tithes and our offerings, it's an opportunity for us to demonstrate to God who it is that we believe him to be. 
And that's what our giving is all about. So I want to encourage you. If you have not given, I want to encourage you to give. If you're giving but you're not tithing, I want to encourage you to trust God with the tithe and watch him pour out more blessing than you can contain. That's what his word promises. Look at what Paul says here. As a farmer who plants a few seeds gets a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. God loves to bless our generosity, but he can't bless what we don't sow. So it's important that we sow. So I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. At all of our campuses, if you want to give, if you have come and you want to get prepared for that, all you can do if you want to write a check is make it out to TFC, and that tithe will go to every campus there. If you want to give in cash, there's an envelope in the seat pocket in front of you, and of course the easiest way is to go online to tfc.org slash give or go through the TFC app, which will get you to the exact same place. And I want to encourage you to give. While you're preparing, though, I want to share one other aspect of our giving. It's, this is our, when we bring our tithes and our offerings. Tithes is the first 10% that belongs to God, but we also have our offerings. And we have here at Trinity, what we have started this year is our Kingdom Builder Fund. We used to have a building fund, but now we have a Kingdom Builder Fund. This is where we encourage you to pray about bringing your offerings. This is what you give over and above the tithe. And the offering is an opportunity for us to advance the kingdom. By becoming a kingdom builder, you're sowing into the missions and the outreach of Trinity Fellowship Church from every single campus. And I just love the way Trinity Fellowship impacts our community. Here just a couple of weeks ago, I was visiting a local establishment and I was there and I had this young man come up to me and he said, hey, are you the pastor of Trinity? And I said, yes, I am. And that in and of itself is not super uncommon. But the next part was a little bit uncommon. He said, well, my name's Michael and I used to be a part of your Clements Unit campus. In other words, he was in maximum security prison. And he attended our prison campus, which is part of our Kingdom Builders. Our Kingdom Builder Fund helps us fund our prison campus ministry. And he just says, I want to tell you how thankful I am for Trinity Fellowship Church and Pastor Larry Miles. He called you out, Pastor Larry, personally. So thankful for Trinity Fellowship. And Pastor Larry, and the ministry that you did for me in the prison, it helped me when I was in there, and it's helping me as I'm out here. That's what it means to be a kingdom builder. It's amazing. So I want to encourage you, be generous. Let's be the most generous people on the planet because we have the most generous Father in the entire universe. Amen? Amen. Well, if you would, grab those buckets at the end of your aisle, and you can pass those across. Thank you for your generous giving. Well, I've just got to tell you, it's been hard to contain myself Uh, in my excitement over the new series that we're about to embark in. We're going to jump in to a new series, and the series title is Kingdom Blessing, The Extraordinary Life Found in God's Kingdom. And as you guys know, if you've been around me for a while, I'm a big fan of talking about the kingdom. I even wrote a book on that subject, and I'm actually writing another one right now that I hope to be out sometime around the end of the year. So I love talking about God's kingdom, because his kingdom is where we find his blessing. It's where we find the fulfillment of everything that Jesus came for. And I've titled this message, Returning to the Garden. So part of the blessing of the kingdom and entering into God's kingdom is that we get to go back and live in the blessing that God originally created in the garden. Now, if you, if you think about Scripture and the way Scripture is laid out, Genesis 1 and 2 talks about how God created the garden, how God created humanity, put humanity in the garden to tend and rule over the garden. And then we have Revelation 21 and 22. So that's the first two chapters of the Bible and the last two chapters of the Bible. The last two chapters talk about the new Jerusalem and how we're going to live in eternity with Jesus and with the Father and Holy Spirit in the new Jerusalem in the end. In between the Garden of Eden and the new Jerusalem, we have God's redemptive plan for humanity. And we have his redemptive plan, and it starts with Abraham even, and Abraham and the blessing that comes through Abraham, but then that wasn't enough. And so it goes all the way to Jesus, and Jesus dying on the cross so that we could enter into his kingdom. And when we enter into his kingdom, that's where we find the fulfillment of everything he has for us. Jesus did not come so that we might merely be saved and make our way into heaven, into the new Jerusalem. He came to restore that which was lost. He came that we might live extraordinary lives. You know, our vision statement of Trinity Fellowship Church is for those hungry for the extraordinary life. And so the extraordinary life is the life Jesus has for us. Look at John 10, verses 9 through 11. One of my life verses. Jesus says, yes, I am the gate. Remember that word gate. I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief, talking about the enemy, the devil, his purpose is to steal, to kill, and destroy. 
But my purpose is to give them, them being us, a rich and satisfying life. That's the extraordinary life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Jesus gave up his life to give you and me the opportunity to live in his kingdom. Not just to be saved, for sure to be saved, but to live in his kingdom and the richness and the blessing that comes in that. Now, God's original design, when we go back and we look at Genesis 1, I'm not going to go through all this. I'm just going to give you a high level, but I encourage you, if you want to read it this week, you can do a quick read between Genesis 1 and 2. His, his rule, his role rather, his purpose for creating Eden and putting humanity in it was manyfold. He gave humanity our purpose to rule and reign over the earth as we expand and protect the garden. He gave us our identity as we were created in the very image of God. Heaven, uh, humanity had unlimited provision in God's kingdom, in his garden. Adam and Eve didn't have to strive for food. They had everything they needed. Humanity had perfect relationship with God in the Garden of Eden. And so we lost all of that when Adam and Eve sinned. But before they sinned, there was no anxiety, there was no shame, there was no conflict. Before the fall, Adam and Eve never worried about how they would make ends meet. If their life were on the right track or how to protect their kids from the evil in the world, Adam and Eve had no such concerns. But then the fall came, sin entered humanity. You know, they made that choice to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were removed from the garden. And the fall bought, brought death and destruction to humanity through the curse. And so this is important for us to understand. If we're going to understand how the kingdom of heaven is working and why the blessings are inside the kingdom of heaven, we have to understand the curse. So I want us to look closely at Genesis chapter 3. So this is after they've sinned. God has confronted them. And now here is the curse that is spoken over humanity. Genesis 3, 16 through 19. Then God said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I command you do not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. So that's the curse. That's the curse that is spoken over Adam and Eve, and that is the curse that is propagated all throughout the line of humanity. When we're born, every individual, every child that's born is born under this curse. It's the curse for all of humanity. We're born under it. And the curse brought pain and destruction to humanity. Now, let me just break down kind of the, the elements and see if any of this makes sense. See if you can relate with any of this as the curse, something that we're fighting against. Reproduction is hard and painful. Now, that certainly was talking about childbirth, but now, if you want, you can have an epidural or there's other ways. And there are ladies, and God bless you, who decide to do it natural. I just, I, that's why we don't have babies. <laughs> I would not do it. I, in fact, I wouldn't want to even, I just don't, don't, just knock me out completely and just let me wake up and there'd be a baby there. That would be the only way that I would be able to have, give childbirth. But I don't think it's just talking about childbirth. I think it's talking about reproduction. It is talking about, it's hard. Reproduction is hard and reproduction is painful. You know, 20% of new businesses fail within the first two years and only 25% make it to 15 years. Why? Reproduction is hard. It is hard to birth something new because there's a curse and things resist it. Relational conflict. Part of the curse is relational conflict. We're going to have conflicts in relationship, especially on the issue of marriage. There's resistance to making a living. It says the ground is cursed. In other words, work is hard. It is hard to make a living. In, under the curse, it is difficult to make a living. It is difficult to make ends meet. There's limits on our resources. We're, we're scratching a living from the ground. Modern translation of that would be you're going to live paycheck to paycheck. You're going to want more, but you're going to be trapped in a paycheck-to-paycheck paycheck cycle where there always seems to be just a little more month than there is paycheck to cover it. It says we will face direct opposition. There's thorns and thistles. There's things that we're going to face that are in direct opposition to trying to advance. They're going to try to hold you back. And then time is limited. From dust you will return, right? So when our time is up, we get to take nothing with us. Part of the curse is that whatever we create here on the earth stays here on the earth. 
And that's part of the curse. Nothing, nothing goes forward. We lose everything upon our death. From death, from dust we came, and from dust we return. Those are all elements of the curse. But here is the good news. Jesus came to reverse the curse. Everything that exists in the curse, Jesus came and does the exact opposite. Jesus counters everything that is in the curse. Look at Galatians 3.13. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on a cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. Church, that's a reason for celebration right there. When Jesus went to the cross, he took on the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles, that's us non-Jews, with the same blessing he promised to Abraham, tying us into the Abrahamic blessing, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Jesus reverses the curse. And that's really what this series is going to be all about. We're going to go through marriage and finances and all of those things. But just think about a few things that you know. Jesus says, don't store up for yourself treasure on earth, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven. What did Jesus do in reversing the curse? Though we return to dust, there is a way to move treasure into heaven. There's a way now where it was cursed that we lose everything. Now there's some that we can pass on. There are things we can invest and we can put in heaven. Jesus said that it's, or the curse said that your marriages are going to be really difficult. You're going to fight. It's going to be a battle. And Jesus says, no, when you do marriage my way, it's wonderful. It's glorious. It's incredible. Parenting is hard under the curse. Parenting gets a lot easier when it's under the blessing of God. All of these aspects of our lives, if we can allow the curse to rest on the cross, and we can move into the kingdom of heaven that God has for us, then we get to live in the blessing. It's a return to the garden. See, what Jesus came is not just to get us into heaven at the end, but to give us access to his blessing as we move today into his kingdom. Way more than just providing the opportunity for salvation, Jesus ushered in his kingdom once again here on the earth. It's an opportunity for us to return to the garden. Now, just think about this. This is amazing. Jesus... In all of the Gospels, this is the beauty of having computers. I was able to look this up. Jesus uses the word love in 60 different verses. So in all of the verses, all the red letter in your Bible, Jesus talks about love in 60 different verses. Compared to 94 verses where he mentions kingdom. Think about this. Jesus talks about his kingdom over 50% more than he spent talking about love. Which do you think was more important to Jesus? Everything Jesus did was centered around his kingdom. Matthew introduces Jesus' ministry. These are the first words of Jesus after he comes out of his temptation. He gets baptized and he goes into the wilderness for 40 days. Here's his first words. This is Matthew 4, 17. Repent of your sins and turn back to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus shares 12 different parables on the kingdom just in Matthew alone. He begins his sermon on the mount, the first words out of his mouth in his great sermon. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Jesus gives his disciples the keys to the kingdom. In Matthew 16, when he's birthing the church, he tells Pilate right before his death, when he is on trial, that his kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. Jesus is constantly talking about his kingdom. And it is safe to say that he was obsessed with his disciples understanding his kingdom. So my first point for us this morning is this. The kingdom of heaven is the new Eden where humanity's relationship to God or with God is restored and where his blessings flow. So when we live, think about that, when you get to live in the kingdom, when you move your life into God's kingdom, it's like taking it back to Eden where the blessings begin to flow and everything begins to move through you once again. It's, it's taking us back into the garden. The kingdom is a spiritual dimension where we have the opportunity to live free from the curse and in his eternal blessing. So I, I want us to think about this. There's two states of humanity that you can live in. You can live under the curse or you can live under the blessing. It's a binary decision. There's two places that you can live, in the curse or under the blessing. And here's the thing. We can be saved and on our way to heaven, but still living under the curse because we're living the world's way. We're not living God's way. And so when I talk about this, when we talk about the opportunity here, we're given this choice of whether we're going to do it our way or God's way. It's possible, even common, for Christians to be saved and on their way to heaven yet still live outside the kingdom of heaven and the blessings found in it. In fact, I would say this is probably the saddest condition of humanity that you can live in. 
other than being eternally damned. But to accept Jesus as our Savior, but then not accept him and step into his kingdom. So we're accepted and saved on our way to heaven eternally, but still operating our lives in such a way and making decisions in such a way that we're still keeping aspects of our lives under the curse instead of moving it into the heaven, the the kingdom of heaven that is now available to us because of the saving grace of Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus. There's only one truth, and that's Jesus' truth. And we have in the life, that abundant life, that extraordinary life that Jesus came to die for is found when we do it his way and we accept his truth. So I want us to look here at Matthew chapter 10. This is a story of Jesus in the rich man. And we're going to see something about the nature of humanity and what keeps us out of entering into God's kingdom. So here we go. Mark chapter 10. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, that means he's on his way to the cross. A man came running up to him, knelt down and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. In other words, do do all the commandments. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Now look, Jesus is talking to him about heaven. He's saying the kingdom of heaven is here. You're going to have treasure. If you go sell everything, you're going to have treasure in heaven. Then, Jesus said, come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. And he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them, but Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of his God. His disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. So Jesus is offering this man the kingdom But he refused and he went away very sad because he had many possessions. In other words, the man's life, the way he was living his life, his definition of success, the way he had measured his life all along is I'm going to obey the commandments and I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to be wealthy and I'm going to be successful. And his desire in all of those things allowed him to accumulate a great many possessions. And yet it was his love for those possessions and that life that he had created that kept him from following Jesus. Now, you guys have heard me say this before. I actually believe this was the man that was intended to replace Judas. He gave up an opportunity to be one of the 12 simply because he was comfortable and he liked the station of his life and he liked the way things were going. Can I tell you, this is what keeps us outside of the kingdom of heaven. Because see, the issue is not his possessions, but it was the hold that his possessions had on him. It, it was, it was his, the hold of those possessions over his heart. My second point is this. Our desire for comfort and control keeps us from the kingdom and from the extraordinary life Jesus has for us. Now, This is a heavy truth bomb, I know it. But I just want to tell you, this is the point. This is the place where many Christians find themselves in a miserable state. Because they've accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They believe that he is God. They believe that he came and gave their life for him. They believe that they were sinners and needed Jesus to pay the price for their sin. And so they've accepted Jesus as their Savior. They believe that God raised him from the dead. And they're living their life. We we live our life. I'm going to confess here in just a minute about where I've done it in my own life. We live our life, though, having accepted Jesus as our Savior, but not yet really made him Lord over every aspect of it. And see, to enter into the kingdom means Jesus is Lord over that area of our life. And to continue to lean into what makes me comfortable. And can I just tell you, for some of us, change is very uncomfortable. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because that would be uncomfortable. And I don't want to make you more uncomfortable than I'm already making you. (laughs) 
to raise our hand and say, we're un- you know, comfort is where we're comfortable in this place. This is the pattern. This is what I do. And I'm not saying this for condemnation, but I just want to say, you know, first Wednesdays are hard. That's not in our schedule. I'm comfortable with the way things are going. And I want to remain in control of my life. Comfort and control keep us out of the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. Doesn't mean you haven't accepted Jesus, but it's going to keep you out of the kingdom. This man let his love for possessions and the comfortable life they provided him, keeping him from surrendering to the lordship of Jesus. Our desire for comfort and control keeps us out. And unfortunately, we as the church have sometimes been guilty of preaching half the gospel. We preach salvation, but sometimes we miss the surrender piece. What it means to make Jesus Lord. So I want to give us this door. Here's my illustration. This is the door to the kingdom of heaven, if you can believe it. Don't rush the stage. It's just a metaphor. Going through this door is not going to change your life. Just a metaphor. But this door is going to be with us through all eight weeks of this series. Because I want us to see what it means to live on one side outside the kingdom and then live on the other side in the kingdom. And so here's the thing about it. Salvation, accepting Jesus as our Savior, gives us access to the kingdom of heaven. Now look at this. This is John chapter 3. This is Jesus speaking with Nicodemus. He says, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus saying to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So until we're saved, this door doesn't exist. And until we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, you can't even find it. I love the way the Passion Translation of this verse is. It says, until we've been born again, we cannot even perceive God's kingdom realm. We, we just can't even detect it. So we get saved, and now all of a sudden we can view it. We can see access. We can see the kingdom now. We can see its promises, and we can begin to see what it is. But it's surrender. Accepting Jesus as our Lord, not just as our Savior, as our Lord that gets us into the kingdom of heaven. Look at what Jesus said to his his disciples in Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. Now, can I just tell you, giving up your own way means giving up control. Taking up your cross means giving up comfort. We have to give up comfort and control to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And look at what Jesus says in verse 25. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And that's what it means to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I want us to imagine, like I said, that this is the kingdom of heaven. And we can enter through this doorway. And just know I'm not going to do it because I'll trip and fall and then y'all have a great video to put on YouTube, but we're not going to do that. (laughs) But this is a door. On this side, see, I'm saved because I can see the door, right? I can perceive it. I can see it. So I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. But to make Jesus Lord, I have to step through the door. I have to go to the other side. I have to make him the Lord of my life in every aspect of my life, which means I'm going to have to give up comfort and control. But here's the good news. On the other side of this door, there is no curse. On this side of the door, I'm still under part of the curse. The curse can still affect my life on this side of the door. But when I go into the kingdom, Jesus paid the price so that the curse can't touch me on that side. Because he took care of the curse for me. But if I stay on this side, then I can still experience aspects of the curse. And so here here is the, the sign that I'm going to put on the door, and here's what we can remember. It's not about me. It's not about me. The key to stepping through this door is to remind ourselves it's not about me. Because on this side, I'm still Lord of my life. On that side, he's the Lord of my life. On this side, I'm in control. On that side, he's in control. On this side, I'm calling the shots. On that side, he's calling the shots. Because i got to go through it's not about me. Sign. Let me see if I can do this. There we go. So it's not about me. We've got to remember it's not about me. You know, I was, I was, I came across a a video here recently that actually explained what a threshold is. And I thought this was pretty fascinating. Back in the day before there was, you know, flooring and carpets and all of that sort of thing, especially for, you know, the, the folks that weren't, you know, living in castles. 
What they did is they would take the thresh, the leftover after the harvest, after they'd separated the grain and they'd done the threshing, they would take what was left over, the thresh, and they would scatter it as the floor, kind of the carpet in their house. It would keep them warm and dry and all of the things that you would expect. And so they would, you know, put several inches of this all throughout their home. But they had a problem. As the kids were running through the house, as the pets were running through the house, and as you were going in and out of the house, the thresh would get all moved around the house, going room for room. And so they created a thresh hold which would be about a four or five inch board that they would put in the doorway that would hold the thresh on each side and keep it from going from room to room. Can I just tell you, this door has a threshold and on one side of it is cursing and on the other side of it is blessing. On one side of it is where we live when we're born in the curse. On the other side is the extraordinary life that Jesus has for us. And comfort and control want to keep us on this side and keep us from stepping across into the fullness. As we, this is my third point. As we surrender our comfort and our control to Jesus' lordship, we enter into his kingdom and the extraordinary life that Jesus has for us. We get to enter in with Jesus as the king. Kim and I had an amazing experience here this past May. We were invited to go to a leadership conference by some friends of ours in the UK. And they said, hey, we're having our annual leadership conference and we would, we would love for you guys to come. And so Kim and I went and we went as their guest. We, we literally thought there was going to be two or 300 people there and it was going to be in their church and it was going to be amazing. You know, we were excited to hang out with our friends there. So this is HTB, Holy Trinity Brompton, there in the UK. Some people that we've gotten to know over the last few years. And so we go to the conference, and turns out it's not three or 400 people. It's 5,000 people from all over the world. It's not in their church. It's in the Royal Albert Hall. It was amazing. And we got to experience all kinds of incredible things. But the night before this leadership conference, we were invited to a dinner. And there's only about 20, 25 of us that were at this dinner. And it was just kind of a pre-dinner of friends. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things where a bunch of people, none of us know each other, are thrown together in an Indian restaurant in the U.K. So... And me being the raging extrovert that I am, this is, my, this is my most comfortable place on the planet. That's not true. But I was nice. And so I sat there and Kim's sitting here. And it's one of those things where it's loud. So, you know, you're, you, you can really only talk to the people that are directly across the table from you. And so I'm, I met the gentleman in front of me. And then a the guy immediately to his right was introduced to me as Malcolm. And I was like, oh, hey, Malcolm, it's nice to meet you. And Malcolm was fun to listen to because he had this deep Scottish accent that I will not try to recreate. But he, it was an amazing, I mean, he was a, he was a great looking kind of stately man with just beautiful silver hair and he had this great Scottish accent. And so we were just enraptured by listening to Malcolm. And so finally I said, hey, Malcolm, what do you, you know, what do you do? And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the House of Lords. Oh, you're Lord Malcolm. Okay. You know, and the House of Lords is like their Senate, but on a higher, you know, kind of a higher level of respect. And so, anyway, we got to connect with him, and it was a lot of fun. So, we, we were visiting with uh, Lord Offord, I believe is how you say his last name. And we're just having this conversation, and we're talking about, you know, things that you talk about dinner. Politics came up, and we're talking about the U.S. And, and our frustration and how mad we are and, you know, the choices we have and all this stuff. And, and here this stately Scottish Lord looks at us and very seriously says, he goes, oh, because I think we were trying to imply some things about the UK. And he's like, no, 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 no. You're citizens. We're subjects. You have rights. We have responsibilities. And it just let, let it sit in for just a minute of like, oh my gosh, first of all, what an amazing country that we get to live in where our founding fathers gave us the opportunity to have rights. And I'm not going to get on my high horse about this, but we will talk about this in one of the things of the series. And if we don't stand up as the church and defend our rights, we can lose them. So it's important that we exercise our rights. And so I'm very excited about the rights that I have as an American. But can I tell you what? Our view of rights as an American can limit us when we come to the kingdom of God. Because while it is true that we are citizens of heaven, I don't recommend that you go into heaven and start demanding your rights. Because there is one king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. There is one God sitting on the throne. You don't go through this door and demand your rights. You go through this door surrendered. No, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me on the other side of this door. And I can just tell you, I have spent so much pain right here fighting to keep it about me so I don't go through this door. 
when I was 25 years old, Kim and I had been married five years, and I know we loved each other, but we were on the verge of divorce. Our marriage was a wreck. I, I, I didn't know what to do. And then on the, the Lord convicted me that I was making our marriage all about me. And when I quit making it about me and I said, Lord, I surrender. Our marriage is not about me. It's not about her meeting my needs. It's about me meeting her needs. It's about me learning to understand her. It's about me serving her the way Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, that I lay my life down for her in the same way that Jesus laid his life down for the church. And the moment, the moment that I got to that place and it wasn't about me, our marriage went from under the curse headed towards the extraordinary life that Jesus has for us. One year later, our marriage is doing great. We're pregnant with our first child. Everything's awesome. And now Kim wants to tithe. <laughs> She's on the other side of the door saying, come on, it's great on the other side. And I'm like, no, no, I am in control of the finances. You can't trust God with money because he let me down once I fought. More on that when we get to the tithe story. I was stuck in this place in my comfort and in my control. And so finally I said, okay, we can tithe. And then we began to see God's blessing. And then now one of my favorite things to do is to write the tithe check every other week when we get paid. Why? Because I get to see the glory of living in the kingdom blessing and out from underneath the curse that God has. Then in 1999, I was standing here again. And I was in this place of just overwhelming. I was 31 years old and I'm just in this place of like, but my career is so important to me and I want to see this done. And I, God, you've told me to be successful and I'm working hard and I have this identity that I'm trying to develop and I have this purpose that I'm trying to develop for my life. And Jesus said, no, I want you to give it up for me. Give it all up for me. And so I remember, I could, I could take you to the spot I was in the floor snotting all over the carpet. Where I said, Jesus, I give my life to you. Whatever you want me to do, I surrender. I surrender my career. It's not about me. It's about you and whatever you want for me. And my career stepped to the other side. It went into the kingdom of heaven. And all of a sudden, it began to blossom. It began to bloom. And incredible things began to happen. Why? Because on this side is a curse. On that side is the extraordinary life. But I've got to be willing to give up comfort and control and let him be the Lord of every aspect of my life so that we can move into that blessing that he has for us. This is an incredible thing. And here's the good news. God regularly confronts us with what we haven't yet surrendered to him. Even just recently, it's too fresh for me to even take you through it. But God has been leading me through a space of wanting me to be broken and reminding me again, it's not about me. And it's been costly. So costly. But it's worth it on the other side. Because that's where the kingdom is. And here's the good news. When we surrender our comfort and control and accept his lordship, that's when we begin to enter into the extraordinary life. Look at what Jesus says. We're going to continuing with Mark chapter 10. In fact, I'm going to back up to the verses we've already read so I can pick it up in context. This is 10 verse 26. The disciples were astounded. And they said, then who in the world can be saved? Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But not with God. Everything is possible with God. Then Peter began to speak up. We've, been, we've given up everything to follow you. He said, in other words, Peter's saying, we're on the other side, Jesus. We've crossed over. Yes, Jesus replied. Now listen, listen. And I assure you that everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news, for the gospel of Jesus, will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and property along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be the least then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. Why? Because those who are investing in the kingdom will have something they're walking into. Those who are investing their life, yes, they may be saved, and it may look like they have their life together, but they haven't given up comfort, and they haven't given up control. And so they may look successful on this side of the door, but on the other side, they're paupers. They're broken. Why? Because it all stayed on this side. Yeah. They weren't willing to give it up to walk through to the extraordinary life that Jesus has for them. Jesus promises us, though, that we can step into the fullness of what he has and the fullness of his blessing. The kingdom of heaven 
is the place where Jesus rules and reigns. It is where he is both Savior and Lord. It is where his way and his truth lead to the extraordinary life that he has for us. Jesus died paying the price for our sins so that his kingdom might be established. And he rose from the dead, proving that he is the Son of God, ushering in his kingdom. Now today, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and he beckons us. I want you to hear these words. I believe this is Jesus speaking to each one of us. Come into my kingdom. Come live here with me. Come away from the curse that's over the world and enter into the blessings of my Father. Come and find your identity. Come fulfill your purpose. Come live the life I have for you. Let go of your perceived comforts. Let go of trying to control your life. Come follow me and I will lead you into eternal life. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your saving grace that saves us. Now, Jesus, we're asking, Holy Spirit, we're asking that you will come minister to us. Let us not be a people who live in the curse, but who surrender so that we can move into the blessing. God, I pray for every marriage that's here, for everyone that is struggling in their relationship today. God, help us all to recognize it's not about us. It's not about me. And let us move our marriage into your kingdom where life can pour in. Father, for every aspect of our lives, our finances, our careers, our parenting, our culture, our vocation, everything, let us move it into your kingdom. God, let us be a people who are not only saved, but we're surrendered. We don't just see you as Savior, but we see you as Lord. And we yield our way to your way. We yield our truth to your truth that we might live out that way. I'm thankful that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but God, you have paid the price. Jesus, you paid the price on the cross. And to get us out from the curse, all we have to do is repent, change our mind and make it about you instead of it being about us. And then we step across that threshold, out from under the ravagings of the enemy and into the blessings that you have in your kingdom, back to your garden, back to that spiritual place where we can live with you. No worry, no anxiety, not just going paycheck to paycheck, but engaging in the blessing of life that you have for us as you care for us as our Lord and our Savior. So Holy Spirit, just come and keep ministering. And if you haven't yet made Jesus your Lord, you can't see the kingdom of heaven yet. It's not even about, you can't even perceive it. So all you have to do is surrender and just say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for paying for my sin. I surrender to you and I receive the forgiveness that you offer. Come, fill me with your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And if that's you, if you just prayed that prayer, would you do me a favor? Get out your cell phone, text the word decision to 88787. We just want to follow up with you and help you take that next step. Church, I just want to tell you on the other side of the kingdom of heaven is the blessing and the extraordinary life that God has for us. So let's dedicate this week to living in his kingdom. God bless you guys. Love y'all. Church family, we're going to take communion together. So if you got in the room and you did not get the elements, would you please raise your hand really high? We've got team members coming down. We want to make sure everybody that wants to take communion with us can. And while you're grabbing those elements, I've got Paxton Lockett here with me to help minister communion. He's one of our high school leaders. He's graduated, but he helped lead a group at Tesco. So all year long, we saw God do amazing things at Tesco. So, so I'm honored to get to, to minister communion with Paxton. Thanks, Dr. Prophet. Now, if you will, please open the bread side of your communion. Let's hold it up together, y'all. This right here is the bread. It symbolizes the body that Jesus broke, that was broke, broken on the cross for us. The word says that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. In other words, we can do nothing good apart from Jesus. So that's why we need this connection. We need community with God. We need intentionality with God. We love because he first loved us. We have a choice right now here in this place and in, in every moment of our lives to choose either I want to do this God's way or I want to do this my way. It's the threshold. I want to do this the world's way or I want to step through that kingdom door and I, do, I want to do this God's way. 
So would you please take this bread in remembrance of Jesus with me? And if you prepare the cup, hold it up with me as well. And Jesus, we just remember your blood that you willingly poured out. Thank you that you give us an entrance into the new life, into the kingdom, into life with you in the fullness. We honor you and we thank you. Let's take the cup. Can we celebrate Jesus together one more time this morning? I got just a couple of announcements and then I want to stand you up and bless you. Our prayer team is going to make their way down front as they do uh, two things. One, this is the last week that we get to bring backpacks and be a part of sharing with the community and help all the elementary students that are going back to school. So we have our backpack outreach bins all around the church. Bring those backpacks and let's, let's bless some families of some kids as we prepare them for school. Also, First Wednesdays, don't forget it. We'd love to see you here in this room for First Wednesday. Would you stand to your feet? Love to bless you as you go into this week. Father God, thank you so much again for your son, Jesus. Trinity Fellowship, I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that Jesus would fill you with his spirit, give you vision for everything that you need, the strength and courage to step on the other side of the threshold, enter into the kingdom, and live out the life that you've been called to with courage, with strength, with fullness, and with peace. In Jesus' name, amen. It's so good to see you this morning. Come on down for prayer.